Hi, uh, again, my name is Glenn Turner, and within this section, I'm going to show you the power of forward enterprise search capabilities. Networks are crazy complex today. And when I was a Juniper in the early days, the most complication we had was managing BGP and MPLS transport. Many of you guys may be of a vintage uh, to remember that as well. That's nothing compared to the hybrid networks organizations manage today. Cloud NFV overlays is simply overwhelming. And unfortunately, network operators today use the same troubleshooting toolkit that I had at Juniper over 20 years ago. And as a direct result, the workload of the network operations teams have increased dramatically. Now, I think we all agree that it simply takes a lot more time to manage a complex system if the instrumentation and tooling doesn't evolve with it. So for instance, does anyone remember this beast? I think we all do. Most people recognize this as the Boeing 747. What they may not understand though, is it takes a full workload of free pilots to manage its flight and navigation systems. That's an amazing workload. Now let's compare that to the modern Airbus A380. This guy can execute his entire flight plan without any human intervention whatsoever. And a 380 is definitely a more complex system than a 747, but it literally does not require pilot. So what made that possible? The answer is advancements in instrumentation tooling. And the result is the pilot is still in control, but the workload is reduced to near zero. And this results in better experience for the crew and the passengers. So many of us here for networks have experienced the pain involved with operating large networks. And we're passionate about reducing the pilots, that is to say the network operators workload. And we accomplished this by delivering a new way to visualize complex network issues. So over the next 10 minutes, I'd like to show you how Ford Enterprise Search functionality gives network operation teams an accurate and deep understanding of the network behavior, and thus reducing the effort and time for network re remediation. So let's jump in, let's get started. So in the previous presentation, and thank you, Elior, he demonstrates the ease of populating Ford Enterprise with device information and executing our first collection. We can then organize that topology into clusters and this enables us to visualize the network in a more meaningful way. So we can easily expand these clusters. All we have to do is double click or we can expand the entire network with the expand all button. Now notice Elior mentioned that the links are automatically detected by many different methods. But these links are automatically detected here and rendered on our topology and we can hover our cur cursor over it and see the connecting endpoints. And notice they're color coded. So we have these green and yellow and gray and red. Primarily the green links allow us to have bi-directional traffic. The yellow denote unidirectional traffic. And then the gray links have no potential at all. And that means that we discovered the links, LDP is up, or LDP, CDP, but for some reason we're not passing traffic at this point. So after parsing the network state information, the platform calculates every possible flow through the network and stores it in a searchable format. Now think about that for a moment. Every port, every IP address, times 65,536 TCP ports, UDP ports, ICMP ports, this is a huge number. So let that sink in for a moment. And we implemented this as a simple user interface using a Google-like search utility. And from here, we can, from this, we can search for, sorry guys, a little glitch here for a moment. From here, we can search for any of your network data. And this is using freeform text or we can explore end-to-end -end network paths through physical, virtual, and cloud networks. So let's have a little fun today. I wanna to illustrate the power of the search feature through some role play. So let's say that I'm a newly hired NetOps engineer. Now I receive a trouble ticket involving an intermittent reachability problem from our internet-based customers here in Atlanta. And they're trying to reach our corporate web services and they're down. At this point, this is all the information that I'm given. Before I can even begin, I need some basic information. I need to know the ingress, egress points in the network. Maybe some IP addresses would be nice. And you guys may run into this as well uh, in your line of work. We get sketchy, incomplete information. And it's very typical, especially with service provider networks. So for most organizations, finding this endpoint information, while it sounds simple, is a horrific exercise. Trying to locate an IP address or MAC address shouldn't be that difficult, but it is. And typically in these large environments, you go through spreadsheets and logs and databases and the search can be endless. So for the first step, I think it's important to utilize Ford Enterprise Tech Search to identify the endpoints of the network path. And in this case, what do we know? We know the issues originating in our Atlanta core issue, our Atlanta core data center. And it would make sense that we should look for some kind of a peering router here. So we can simply go to our search bar and I'm gonna type in ATL. 
Now, what's happened in the back end is we've committed a search through our mathematical model, and we've, we've rendered this, these devices on the screen. ATL Internet seems to be logical, so let's take a look at that guy. So immediately we see where ATO Internet has any occurrence in our state within our data. And we also see this as a Juniper MX device. We see the state information categorized here. And we also see it on the topology screen, where it's located. So this is probably a good guess for our first point. Now, what about the opposite endpoint? We know it's a corporate web application. So it's reasonable to assume it's hosted somewhere behind an application de delivery controller. So let's check the objects tab for virtual IP. The objects menu enables to operate or to group devices in useful ways. And this can assist greatly with search criteria like grouping routers and firewalls together and host. Also for our application services under header sets. So let's start here. Let's try to find something that is like corp or application or web server or what have you. So if we type in corp, we immediately filter down to this tip. Core Web App Public VIP. This looks like a good candidate for us. And we see that it's, that it's resolved to this IP address. So now let's quickly, let's quickly explore this IP address and see what information we can glean from it. So if we just simply paste that into our search bar and hit enter, we'll see every occurrence of where that IP address exists in our network. If it was an actual host, we would see a host column as well. We don't see that here, but we do see something very crucial. There's an ad entry. So our users are actually being added through the firewall, which is pretty typical for the service provider, to a private IP address. And this private IP address probably represents the VIP uh, on the load balancer cell. So now I'm armed with a lot of information. Very quickly, I've identified these endpoints. So now we can move on to analyzing our flow. To initiate the path search, we simply input information directly into the search bar. And we've, we're going to state things like source destination info, protocol, ports, anything relevant right to our search. And it's going to, the system is going to calculate this and give us every end-to-end -end path that a packet can traverse from point A to point B. We initiate this directly in the search bar. Or if we want to do something more simple, we can simply use our quick path search window, which I'll do here. So all we have to do is very simple. We know the two endpoints now, ATO Internet. And so we'll do a quick look up, look up as we type in corp web out pub vip. Now, while I'm troubleshooting this, I'm going to see all the paths. So I'm not going to try to limit this at all at this point by putting in a traffic type. So let's leave that empty. So just to click away, very quickly, right, we come up with the end-to-end -end paths that are capable for traffic to travel from Atlanta Internet uh, to our uh, endpoint where the server is. These path search results are organized in the three different sections. So let me briefly show you this. This one's pretty obvious, right? So we have our flow that is superimposed on top of our topology. And the filter section provides attributes that allow us to refine and tighten our search. More about that later. For the moment, I'm really only concerned about traffic that's being delivered to my endpoint. In the path analysis section, we are showing every flow from Atlantic internet to the web server and all the hot by hot packet processing for the flow. I can click on any of these and we investigate in detail how the packet traverses a device. Firewalls are normally very interesting because they provide different types of processing. So let's take a look at this firewall for a moment. As you can see, we're doing layer through switching. We're also providing NAT capability as well, which that should be no surprise. We actually saw this before in our text lookup. And we're providing some ACL. So, Think about this for a moment, right? This is absolutely incredible. The platform simplifies the presentation of the packet processing, and it expresses the behavior in a very simple way. I don't know anything about this device yet. I don't know the manufacturer. I don't know anything about how they've implemented their ACLs. It could be Juniper, which is totally different from Cisco in terms of policy, but I can read, and I really only have to read. I'm permitting these two destination IP addresses, which are probably our private VIPs on the load balancer, or IP protocol, TCP, and then HTTPS and SSH. If I want to see more information, I can click on device state. And very quickly, I'm brought down to the handful of configuration lines that are contributing to this action. So think about this, right? 
a number of you are in network operations today or have been in network operations before, and you've combed through thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines trying to find that specific proverbial needle in a haystack that's contributing to a behavior or, or an anomaly in the network. So this is extremely useful and it saves so much time for our operators. So Glenn, I got to interject here. Uh, yes. I've seen firewalls with about 400,000 lines of config, but this also has a load balancer. And how many years were you at A10? I was there eight years. Okay, so yeah. would this have been useful there? You know, would it would this have been a difference for you or the customers? Yes, absolutely. And, and for those of you that, that have you know, worked with L4 through L7 devices. I mean, load balancers are notoriously difficult uh, to maintain and to configure, depending on the, the types of configurations that you have. But just, you know, look, look how we're rendering this information. We have all of our virtual server information here. Uh, we understand the destination IP, right? The destination IP NAT is happening. So from our VIP to our actual server pool, all that's right here in plain language. And then those servers actually are hanging off uh, of their network somewhere off some switch or somewhere. So we're layer three switching that information out to the actual endpoint. But you're right, Brandon, this is very personal to me because, you know, the first time I saw a search result with the load balancer in a path, it was an epiphany. That's when I was sold on what this product could do. My jaw literally fell open. And this is why I installed thousands of load balancers for you know, service providers and enterprise alike over those eight years. And we always, always had very complex routing environments, route health injection and clustering and you know, et cetera. And many times the backbone core engineering group, they would misconfigure the routers, right? And it's simply because they just didn't really understand the dynamic nature and what would be happening. They would have ACLs, they'd have it tightened down. It wasn't, I don't wanna say they were bad engineers, they weren't bad at all. They just didn't really understand what was happening and all of the use cases for failover. So of course they blamed the applications group by extension blaming the ATN device and vice versa. So these trouble tickets would get volleyed back and forth. And you guys may experience this every day, right? Between these two groups. And it would take many hours, if not a day to resolve those issues. So the reason that I was so taken with this is that for me personally, if these companies would have had Ford Enterprise to visualize that path end to end, as I'm showing you now, it would have taken seconds to isolate that problem. And I would have been on a jet going home and spending more time with my family, right? From a business perspective though, what we're really doing here is we are racing these boundaries between these functional groups. And we're giving every operator the ability to troubleshoot paths within and outside of their functional group. And we were removing the need to escalate trouble tickets, right, back and forth and wasting that time. Thank you for that question. Can I have a, a quick question? Go ahead. Yes. I, yes. I, so um, a pr previous presenter today just mentioned that the that it's only as good, your automation is only as good as your data. So I was kind of curious to know um, from, from the set of data that you've been pulling uh, these data paths from, how often does it get updated and what, what does that mechanism look like? That is totally up to uh, configuration. You can't, we have customers that are collecting every three hours. We have some uh, customers that are collecting every hour. The point is, it's how much performance do you have? So what's the time duration of that collection event? And that's going to drive how much collection, how many collecting events you can have per day, per month, or what have you. So you're exactly right. You need fresh information. And we have optimized our, our collectors, LEO over showing, and the system as a whole to be able to pull that information in very, very quickly and then process it and get that parsed into the network model. More importantly, from an automation standpoint, and, and I'll make this point and I'll move on, is that you need data that's not siloed. The applications group may be storing their data one way. You may have big data over here from the, from the core networking group. And these things are islands and you can't get to it. More importantly, what you need to be able to do is normalize the data. I don't want to write an individual Ansible script to go get interfaces from a Cisco box. And then I have to write one for a Juniper box. And I have to write one for F5. And, and the list goes on and on. And it just becomes an unmanageable process. I want to normalize that data so that I'm getting at variables, just like a dot operator in Python. I'm getting at a variable. I want to parameterize. And I don't care what the device is. I want it normalized. And I want to be able to give access to everyone. So when you're working within the mathematical model, you're not working in the network. So there is absolutely no harm in the security of people allowing access to firewall param parameterized data to the network operations group or an applications group. So it's a very good question. Thank you for that. 
can, can I follow up on that? Do Absolutely. You, do you have do you ever have issues with customers that uh, between the freshness of the model that that you're troubleshooting on and the actuality of the network that you 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 lose um, that you lose your troubleshooting expertise kind of in that gap where you've identified a problem uh, in the model and it's it, and that's not the case uh, in real life or vice versa. Are you safe? How do, and how do you address that yeah. issue? Yes, Elior, go ahead. Glenn, mind if I chime in? Absolutely. Right? I, I, that's an excellent question. A lot of people ask this. Uh, pretty much everybody asks that. <laughs> There's a, there's a notion that I didn't cover. I probably should have. There's a notion of partial snapshot. Instead of taking a big snapshot of everything in your network and then taking the time to do that, you can take a partial snapshot. So for those customers who are concerned about data freshness, you can use that. Okay. So so go into that. So that, is that like I am going to take a look at half my devices today and the other half tomorrow or half my devices in this hour or is it it's is it something like that Elior, or how, how does that yeah yeah that, that's a very good question it's totally up to your particular use case what are you trying mm -hmm. to do and as you will see in the next presentations and in the remainder of this one there are some nuances where you need complete snapshot sometimes you need partial sometimes you need one device okay right? so stay tuned there's going to be a really <laughs> cool stuff, set of stuff that we show here okay I'll, 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 I'll uh, stand down for a moment. How's that? Well, I want to give a little more color to the answer because I think you're also getting to something else, which is what is, what is the blocker? How If we want to get faster and faster and get closer and closer to real time, to get to <laughs> real time, how do you do it? And in some of the networks were deployed, our collector is not the limiter. It's the devices that need to support faster interfaces. It's the TACAC servers that need to be upgraded so we can go much wider. We have a collector that goes over a thousand in parallel. It could get a lot of stuff very quickly. I remember even a few years ago, our median collection times were below 30 seconds for large networks. So we're, we're constantly looking for new protocols, new ways to speed up collection. One, one quick example of how to drive that time down aggressively to optimize the one place where it's not doing too well uh, is with some, I think this was Juniper, uh, BGP tables were really large and that wasn't an optimized command. And so we looked at BMP and implemented that in a, a few ways to speed up that collection time. So we are constantly finding ways to drive that collection time and get it towards near real time on both the collection side and then the processing side. In fact, recently we started to interleave those two phases so that many times you don't even notice that there's a processing phase because it's been hidden inside the time for a few of those slowest devices. This is a much longer conversation and I think we'll save some of the rest of it for the end, but I'd love to go there because this gets to how you practically deploy it and how fast it's gonna be. Brandon, real quick, and, and, and if you're gonna cover this as part of what you just mentioned, um, from, from a collector perspective, can I scale collectors um, to increase or do you not see that as a, and, and we can get to that later too as well. Yeah, so we've never come across a network where the collector was itself the limiter to the speed of collection it's always the devices. It's always Which is what you just said. breadth of the TACAC server. Okay. So when we get to a network where uh, the data says it's something to optimize, we'll, we'll be happy to look into that. Perfect. Thank you. Keeps things simple if it's in one place also. Brandon, Elior, thank you for that. So let's jump back into our path search. For now, we have found a working path. How, however, what protocols are flowing? We cast a large net, as I like to say here. So we need to further refine the path to gain some deeper insight. So that's exactly what the filter tablet allows us to do. Here we can select ingress and egress interfaces, additional devices, as well as narrow the focus for source destination IPM protocol. So how do we use this? Well, for example, web services require one, TCP, HTTP, HTTPS, in some cases, Google Quick, you need UDP as well. In this case, though, so I want to stipulate this using the filtering capability. So we're going to tighten our search and see if our flow state changes. We do this very simply. We can select IP protocol, and we have TCP, and then we're going to select HTTPS. Now, notice that we are pre-filling with the correct syntax into our search bar. I also still care about my delivered traffic, right? And we can also modify this as well within the search bar itself. 
Now, the most important thing is that we have a valid search. How do I know it's valid? Because I don't see any anomalous effects. I don't see any ACLs that are coming up in red saying we're dropping packets or something's blocked or we're looping packets or anything like that. So we conclude from this that HTTPS traffic is flowing. Now let's check HTTP. It's very simple. We go up to the L4 destination port field and we simply just backspace into HTTP and then we'll hit enter again. Ah. Now, this is interesting. No results are found. Let me explain exactly what that means because it's not always intuitive. What it means is there's no valid paths between our Corp web app public VIP and the Atlanta internet that satisfies TCP and HTTP. So how do we really figure out what's happening? Well, HTTP is not flowing. So if we remove delivered, we're going to show all paths and all statuses of paths. So if something is dropped, if it's looped, if there's a black hole, all of these things can be detected within our model. So let's simply just click on status delivered and remove this. So immediately check this out, right? So we see that we're dropping HTTP packets. So this prevents the load balancer from being able to switch from this, the incoming HTTP request to an HTTPS session. So anyone with a, you know, any modern browser, if they're not actually putting in HTTPS or have it in cache or have it, in, have it saved, uh, they're going to hit this dropped uh, policy on this firewall, and hence they're not going to make it through to the web service. So we found our problem. So we can further verify this as we did before. You guys saw this already, right? We click on our firewall and we see all the state information in plain English, exactly what's happening. We're denying these two IP addresses, pretty important IP addresses. These are our load balancer VIPs. So the problem's explained. Again, we can click on see device state, and we see again that handful of configuration lines that contribute to this particular outcome. So the next question is this, if I fix the firewall issue, does the traffic flow to the intended location? I can't assume this solves the problem. The reason is there could be other devices filtering packets beyond this firewall. And for this, we created the permit mode all, or permit all mode. And let me talk to you about this. While we can never do this in the actual network, this is a super cool feature that we have. The mathematical model gives us a safe place, right? We're not doing this in your network. We're doing it in the mathematical model so that we can actually negate or ignore all of the, all of the policy for layer four. And, and, and Glenn, yes. Glenn mind, if I, mind if I chime in real quick? Go ahead, Elior. Oh, thank you. I, I just want to, to make sure that we slow down a little bit mm -hmm. because this is really, really important. What you're looking at is a path, right? And the path goes, reaches the firewall and it gets dropped. Now, how would you do it if you were troubleshooting this live on the device? Right? You'd say, well, you know, yeah, I get it. It's dropping access list. Right. But I need to, for just for a second, let's pretend that it's allowing. Why is that? Mm -hmm because I want to analyze that my converged state of the network, all of your protocols, control plane protocols, such as BGP, OSPF, well, spanning tree, VXLAN, and everything that you have, that everything actually converged. You know why? Because network in this case, right, is all, you know, interweaved and using permit all mode, it, it, Glenn, if you type that in, permit all, mm -hmm. what, you, what you basically will see is we now have ability to deduplicate and analyze separately the routing and switching convergence, all of the protocols, control plane, layer two, layer two, all of that, separately in isolation from your access policies, access control, firewall rules. Because what you need to make sure as a network engineer is that your network is cor um, correctly provisioned and converged. On top of that, you supply firewall policies and access lists. I hope that makes sense. This is what Permatol brings. Glenn, back to you. Thank you very much. So as we can see, we are now ignoring this ACL. And we also see that we're not striking through any other policy along the path. So exactly as Elior said, I could have, you know, he mentioned decoupling routing from firewall policy. I could have a null route down here to store traffic out for some reason, right? And that's why I need to be sure before I escalate this ticket to the security team that by fixing this firewall, we're actually going to address the problem. And by seeing now by uh, dis not disabling, but by ignoring this ACL, we actually see traffic flowing for HTTP. So we conclude from that, that if we correct the firewall problem, 
that we're going to bring remediation to this uh, problem overall. This single feature is very important because the exact cause of the fault is what it's focusing on. And this allows for me to efficiently and confidently send that ticket off to the security team. And so Glenn, if, if there was another firewall on the path that needed to change, we'd see two different devices that have those purple strike throughs, right? That's correct. Okay. Absolutely or if there was correct. an ACL on a router or something. That's correct, Carol. We, any router, any ACL, any L4 filtering that's happening, we would see that through here as well. The load balancer would be a, a, another spot where we might see that as well from a security perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, let me, as I close, I'm gonna press this point on you, right? Look how quickly we were able to gather this crucial network information and localize these network endpoints. And we verified our network path with HTTPS. And we also found the fault in the firewall policy dropping that HTTP traffic. So what we are passionate about doing is giving you that advanced instrumentation. Remember that Airbus 380? That's what we wanna do for your network. We wanna help your IT organization work effectively and efficiently. And today we illuminated how Ford Enterprise search function drastically reduces that time, right? To gather that crucial information and analyze that complex packet flow. And we've seen from our customers, this will have a direct impact on business, on business velocity by increasing the IT agility. Path flow is, is super impressive. I'm, I'm really impressed at the capabilities here. One thing I saw on the flow was, um, I think I saw VRFs and, and maybe even a spine and, and leaf. Are you able to actually incorporate those types of logics into these flows, you know, the VRF context, and then I'm guessing the overlays inside those leaf spine fabrics. Absolutely. We just want a very large account uh, with, with a cable provider. You would automatically know who they are if I could name their name, but that's exactly why they were interested in four networks. They had a very complex network where they were routing in and out of these verfs. And they were also using VXLAN, EVPN, uh, over Juniper as well. So they needed two things. One is they needed to provide instant correlation between the underlay and the overlay. And that's something that we do very, very quickly, as fast as you saw that path search come up. Uh, secondly, they needed to be confident that when they were mapping a specific VXLAN layer three gateway into a VRF that was reaching a set of firewalls. And this is really important because obviously we don't want session discontinuity between firewalls because we dropped the session, right? So the way they're handling the load balancing of these individual firewalls is through those VRFs. So exactly. And uh, you know, as far as I know, there was no other product on the market to give them that, that type of information. We do it very, very quickly. And you know, before that, it was taking them you know, hours to actually figure all this out for their network. Also, they didn't even realize they need to do negative testing is there any way for this particular verf to reach the wrong set of firewalls? And that's something else we can do within the search criteria as well. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Good stuff. Um, small question. Before, early, early in the demo, you were showing the different regions. Did you tag it or how did you know this was Atlanta, Southeast, Northeast, blah, 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 switch? Yeah, that's a great question. So we'll create those clusters manually. And then we have the ability to use glob patterns and, and regex and what have you to find individual devices of interest and then populate those clusters. Okay. Um, so like, could you select a whole group of them based on some pattern is what you're saying? Absolutely, you? yes. Okay. So these ones should be Atlanta or, okay. Correct. And pretty much everything in the interface is API drivable, if you're interested. I have a, I have a question as well. Um, and forgive me if, uh, if you covered it, um, but how do, on the, on the um, modeling for, for paths, how do you handle things like uh, equal cost multipathing and, and those kinds of things? So typically, so when you look at header space analysis, how it works, it's going to collect those. And like you said, it's going to see those as equal cost paths, right? So because we are data plane centric and not control plane centric, we're basically, it doesn't really matter which one of those we choose along the path. We're going to show you that there is a equal cost multipath group. And anytime there's equal cost routing, we're going to show you that there was a tick mark. I wish I still had that up. There's a tick mark actually in the path uh, along that device. So if it does have an, an additional way to get through the network, you'll see that as another path. In this particular case, we just saw that there was one single path, right. but there could be multiple paths to the network. And it was showing that counter where we have one of one, you can show you one of four or what have you. Okay, so when, within, the, within the map display, uh, it's pretty easily discernible then? Absolutely, yes. I, I will add just a touch of color onto that, Brian. 
when you have multiple paths and they are equal cost paths, it doesn't matter what protocol, control bring protocol have led to convergence of the network into that state with ECMP, equal cost, multiple paths. We will display that as multiple options. But what's really, really important and where it, I have had, um, I wanna say two and a half customers, but two customers who really had the strong, you know, uh, um, opinion on this. Here's why. When you have multiple paths and your traffic wanders off in a place where you did not expect that, that this is where the source of confusion comes from. In our product, in, in our path that you saw there, we actually will use deduplication. So unique paths, even though they, there may be multiple equal cost paths, will be deduplicated from wanderers, so to say. So that's something that we are not showing this today, but I mean, happy to show you later as well. It's it's really, really powerful thing that Glenn showed it. I hope that makes sense, Brian. It, it does, so, but uh, just to, to add on to that, that um, would it be a similar experience with uh, like port channels and, and, and lag groups, things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about a ECMP routed firewall where URPF is failing on one of the interfaces? And so therefore traffic wouldn't flow through that based on the firewall logic. Excellent, excellent. So all of the data plane manipulation, all of the validation checks within the device itself are actually embedded into our behavioral model. So if device in real world would drop packet because it fails URPF check, uni, uh, unicast reverse path uh, forwarding, right? Verification then in the model, it will do exact same thing. So you will get one-to-one -one mapping of the behavior in the network. 